Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Richard Roth. I am the uh, journalism dean at Northwestern University in Kotak. First of all, when you think about can you see the future, well, some people can see the future. Uh, at least it looks like they can. Here on the screen, I hope it's on the screen now. Is the screen working? Yeah. Yes, okay. In, uh, in 1879, three years after Bell invented uh, the, the telephone, a, a um, French seer, futurist, named Albert Robida, began to think about what, would, what that might mean for the future. And here's what, in this cartoon published in Punch magazine, what Robida saw, he, he saw the telephone as a video conferencing device. Big screen. You can see that the uh, man on the left is holding what is then the telephone or microphone, talking from London to his daughter in Semon. Big video conference. Uh, and they're talking back and forth. He's asking a question about some who is this other girl in the picture there. Uh, Robida also, 140 years ago, saw home entertainment. A big plasma screen with entertainment. You see the family sitting around and enjoying this. So people do see the future. They do understand something. Then here's a, a quote from an, an American uh, journalist. Uh, every American journalist should and probably has read the autobiography of William Allen White. Well, here in, in 1931, he was a great Kansas editor. Here's what he says. Of course, as long as man lives, someone will have to fill the herald's place. Someone will have to do the bell ringer's work. Someone will have to tell the story of the day's news and the year's happenings. A reporter is perennial under many names and will persist with humanity. But whether the reporter's story will be printed in type upon a press, I don't know. I seriously doubt it. I think most of the machinery now employed in printing the days, the weeks, or the months' doings will be jumped by the end of this century and will be as archaic as the bell ringer's bell or the herald's trumpet. New methods of communication, I think, will supersede the old. Saw so this. Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha, as he's called, the great American investor, said just uh, two years ago, simply put, if cable and satellite broadcast, as well as the internet, had come along first, Newspapers as we know them probably would never have existed. And then this is the, the chairman of the New York Times said two years ago, I don't really know whether we'll be printing the Times in five years. And you know what? I don't care. Now you may have read the current issue of the Atlantic the magazine. Uh, there's a story in there that lays out what, what is a, a plausible theory that the New York Times will cease publication as a newspaper in May of this year because of its huge debt load and the convergence of, of, of being able to pay it. It's a pretty, maybe scary idea, but the New York Times, well, uh, it may happen. Well, how will people get their news? What will happen with the Times? Salzburger has been saying for a long time, we're not a newspaper company. We're an information company. So there are these other ways of, of the Times being distributed. Kindle now, this little handheld uh, device, because the Times is published digitally, it can be uh, uploaded to the Kindle to read your Times there. You can, of course, read newspapers, on a cell phone, it is, you've heard the conversation this morning about cell phones, it is our belief at Northwestern that this is, this is the device of the future for delivering news. Our students here will be taught how to produce news for the small screen, video, text, whatever. Uh, it's there now, it's how, it's how I read my news. Uh, then there's the new iPod Touch, the bigger screen for, uh, downloading uh, and reading uh, newspapers. And then there's this one. So there's the magic of something called e-ink. 
the New York Times could be delivered to your cereal box or to any other <coughs> device that there's simply a wired uh, satellite receiver inside this thin thing and it collects E8 now exists, it's being tested all over the US. And so when you have your cereal box in the morning, maybe you could sit and read the times on that. Uh, and then there's maybe another way to get the times. At Northwestern, we, we set out a couple of years ago, about four years ago, to think about this convergence of information and, and web. And our computer scientists there went out and developed a program whereby it, if a program goes out to the web every day and looks at the, starts with the New York Times and then we've, we've picked five or six other uh, publications of importance for it to look at and it sees the biggest stories. What do they all agree on are the big stories? It then pulls that story into the computer, rewrites it into broadcast style by itself, no computer touches anything. And then it measures how much of that story is being talked about by the bloggers. And then it goes out to the blogosphere and finds what the bloggers are saying about this news event. This is crowdsourcing. And it brings that story back and it hands the story off to an avatar who, who then uh, presents the story without a human ever touching it. Let's see if we can make this work. And I'll show you an example. This is a couple of years ago. Hi, I'm Alex Vance, and welcome to News at 7, a daily produced automated news show. This is the news for July 9th, 2007. President Bush and Boyd's executive privilege Monday to deny requests by Congress for testimony from two former aides in connection with the firings of federal prosecutors. The White House, however, did offer again to make former counsel Harriet Myers and one-time political director Sarah Taylor available for private, off-the-record interviews. In a letter to the heads of the House and Senate Judiciary panels, White House counsel Fred Fielding insisted that Bush was acting in good faith and refused lawmakers' demand that the President explain the basis for invoking the privilege. Now, from the blogosphere, Slow down and hear me out. It is no secret that I opposed the Myers nomination. I also do not believe the theory that this was some horrible miscarriage of justice. I do not think conservative opinion makers were responsible for her withdrawal. People have a constitutional right to free speech. They have the constitutional right to pressure both the Congress and the executive with any verbal tool they feel like using. I think this demonstrates strength of character and participation in government. Thanks for hearing me out. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Thanks for watching. If you would like us to announce something or say hi to someone, please follow the contact link at the top of news at 7.com. Don't be shy. Thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day. Bye-bye. You should know that uh, this, this program is now is much fancier now with a you know, different avatar, but it's, it's now not on the web because a big American media company has bought it from, from us uh, because it thinks maybe this is how it can deliver its news and not I mean, hire reporters. And, so I guess. Uh, so all of this, all of this stuff. What does it say? Is it saying print is dead? Well, Leonard, you heard him say a few minutes ago. He thinks it's dead uh, in two or three years. But there, there are some indication that it's alive. 
and going to be alive. Uh, here is a Chicago Tribune. Uh, the, the Chicago Tribune on the left is the one you see on the newsstands all the time. The one on the right is a new product that the Tribune created for young people, 18 to 25. It's handed out at the, at the L stops, the subway stops. Um, and some people buy it at home. But there's, they're getting, they have 750,000 of these out every week. It is sold out in advertising. They fixed the size of it at the outset and said it's not going to be a tabloid that's this thick because young people don't want it that thick. It has to be no more than 80 pages or whatever, some, some relatively small number. And they sold out the advertising in it. Uh, it's print dead. Look at this magazine created in the 21st century. Three and a half million sold now. Uh, you may remember it started out as once every two months, and now it's uh, monthly huge. Uh, I can't see if it's in there. There was another one there. Well, I was going to show you an example here. Is the one on that screen? Probably not. Of a new magazine created in, in Doha uh, at the Lawrence Publishing Company uh, called Glam. It's, it's hot right now. The, with the young people like it. So here's the deal. Circulation of news paid newspapers has increased in the last year and a half worldwide. There are new newspapers being founded up every day in India. There's new one, one since I started coming to Doha, new here, the uh, Qatar Tribune. 99 million sold every day in India, 107 million sold in China. Japan, paid circulation is three times that of the U.S. and on average they cost three times as much. Newspaper circulation in the U.S., however, is falling and falling fast. It's, uh, it's in 25 years, it's gone from 63 million to 50 million. It's going down and one of the things that, that what Leonard said and what I want to do while I'm here is to help the, uh, uh, this region avoid the, the, the crisis that will probably likely befall it uh, if it doesn't brace for it, doesn't begin to adapt the new technologies, the, the web. Uh, we're going to help. Uh, our students are being trained for the, the future, and uh, I think it will, it will happen here. Not in three or four years, in my judgment, the way uh, Leonard thinks, but uh, perhaps in 30 or 40 years. It won't be newspapers. Maybe way faster than that. But people are clearly, more of them, more of them every day, getting their news on their cell phones. We have to be prepared for that. Anyway, that's my 10 minutes.